Jim, thank you. All right, we are continuing our survey of the Old Testament, which we're about to wrap up after five long years. <laughs> the uh, Old Testament is uh, divided into four groups of books, the Pentateuch, the books of history, the books of poetry, the books of prophecy. We've already finished our examination of the Pentateuch, the books of history, the books of poetry, working our way through the books of prophecy. All the books of prophecy were written by prophets who lived and wrote after the time of the divided kingdom. The divided kingdom was the time when the northern kingdom separated from the southern kingdom. And these books of prophecy are divided into three groups. The pre-exilic prophets, that is the prophets who lived prior to the time of the Babylonian captivity. The exilic prophets, these were the men who lived during the time of the Babylonian captivity. And then there were the post-exilic prophets who lived and wrote after the time, after the Jews returned from the Babylonian captivity. We're presently working our way through the three post-exilic prophets, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Haggai and Zechariah are the ones we're working through right now. You have notes in the back on Malachi, which we may get to a piece of at least this evening. I'm not sure. Anyway, Haggai and Zechariah were raised up by God to encourage the children of Israel to rebuild the temple. The situation was this. The Jews returned from the Babylonian captivity in about 538 B.C. They built the brazen altar. They laid the foundation for the temple in 535 B.C., and then they stopped working because they were getting harassed by the local Gentiles and also because they were more interested in building their own homes rather than God's house. So after 15 years, in 520 B.C., God raised up two prophets, Haggai and Zechariah, to encourage the children of Israel to rebuild the temple. They laid the foundation, but they stopped work. Get on with it, guys. That was the point. These two men had complementary messages. Haggai was the stick. Zechariah was the carrot. Haggai is the stick, rebuked the people for working on their own homes and, sticks and skipping God's house. Zechariah uh, held out the carrot. He uh, told the children of Israel about the coming Messiah to encourage them. And basically what he did was talk about Israel's glorious future. The Israelites had every reason to be encouraged in their service to the King of kings and the Lord accords Jehovah their God. And so he tried to encourage them. Right now we're working our way through Zechariah. Zechariah, as pointed out, is a wonderful but difficult book because of the uh, eight uh, visions that uh, Zechariah wrote about in the first six chapters. It is a book that predicted more about the Messiah than any prophet except Isaiah. In fact, there's so many predictions about the prophecy about the coming Messiah and the future of Israel that is called the Revelation of the Old Testament. And it's filled with important passages for those who love the Jewish people because it talks a lot about how one day, in spite of their stubborn, stiff-necked rebellion, uh, the Jews are, as a nation, going to turn to Jehovah and celebrate him. Over, throughout history, many individual Jews have worshipped the Lord and lots of individual Jews accepted, have accepted Jesus as the Messiah even in the first century. But one day, the nation is going to turn to Jesus as their Messiah and their Savior. The book of Zechariah is divided into three sections. Section one is the eight visions about God's future plans for Israel. That's the first six chapters. We've already examined those chapters. Uh, the second section is four messages that God gave in response to their questions about fasting. And then the third section is two oracles. An oracle is a divine pronouncement and there were th uh, the, the last six chapters of Zechariah has two oracles. One oracle is about the first coming of the Messiah. The second oracle is about the second coming of the Messiah. With that little bit of an introduction, uh, let's move on. These messages, we finished, as I pointed out, the eight visions about God's future plans for Israel. Uh, now we're going to work through the four messages that uh, God gave to the Israelites in response to their questions about fasting. And the reason they had questions about fasting was because on the fourth and the fifth and the seventh and the tenth months, the children of Israel had been fasting to, as a memorial to the destruction of the temple. And 
And uh, now that it was being rebuilt, they came to Zechariah and said, should we continue fasting? And uh, because for the destruction of the temple, because after all, it's being rebuilt. And so God gave them four messages in response to that question. These messages, as pointed out, were given in response to the people asking, should they continue to fast for the destruction of the temple? Now that the temple is being rebuilt, and the fasts, these were not mo- fasts that were required by the Mosaic law. These, made them, these, these fasts they made up on their own, which wasn't bad. It's just that uh, there's probably a certain lack of genuineness in them. His <coughs> first message of the four messages was an attack on empty ritualism. The issue was this. They came and said, should we continue fasting as a memorial for the destruction of the temple? And God's first attack was, why have more empty rituals? <laughs> it probably would have been okay. I don't think God would have disapproved if their hearts were in them. But the Israelites had a real problem with empty ritualism. Judaism had lots and lots of rituals. They had uh, lots of, they, they had seven annual feasts. They had Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of First Fruits. They had Pentecost, the Feast of Trumpets. They had the Feast of the Day of Atonement, the Feast of Tabernacles. They had lots of feasts. There were lots of rituals. And uh, the Israelites, like so many men and women in religions throughout the world, they thought they, they scored points with God by just simply exercising the ritual. And that's unfortunately, uh, th- was unfortunately their attitude. And that's unfortunately the attitude even Christians have. I grew up in the South in the Bible Belt, and I can tell you, it ain't really the Bible Belt. I, I, my father was an evangelical pastor. I could tell the difference between that and your local Baptist church. Now, I'm not knocking all those Baptist churches. Please don't misunderstand. But the truth is, people practice rituals. They thought, well, there, there is probably a God. I mean, evangelicalism was the local cultural religion. So people thought it was important to get baptized and to take communion, and one of the rituals was going to church sometimes, especially on Easter and on Christmas. And I've talked to these people. They were my friends. They viewed that you scored points by, with God by exercising rituals. They felt like they scored points with God by going to church occasionally. And this, in a sense, is true for most religions. Most religions are ritualistic, and people do, in those false religions, score points with their gods by exercising those rituals. Unfortunately, that crept into Judaism. It's crept into Christianity. You don't score points by going to church. I know that bothers some people, so you say, why are we here? <laughs> but it's a ritual. You come because you want to work, you want to, Join with brothers and sisters and worship the God you love. That's why you're here. If you're just coming to score points with God, stay home. That's a little harsh. But understand, rituals don't cut it. And in the Old Testament uh, prophets, God denounced the Israelites for their ritualism. And that's, in effect, was what was his first attack. They said, we want more ritual. And he says, wait a minute, guys. The ones I've already ordained... You, your hearts aren't in when you exercise them. So why do you need more empty ritualism? Empty ritualism was part of the nation's history. God had no use for the empty religious rituals, so there was no point in adding more empty rituals. Let me read it. Chapter 7. Then the word of the Lord Almighty came to me. Ask all the people of the land and the priests, when you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh months for the past 70 years, was it really for me that you fasted? And when you're eating and drinking, were you not just feasting for yourself? Because there were feasts. There were fasts and there were feasts. And the feasts, like the Passover feast and so many others, were designed to celebrate God. But God is saying, when you fast, it really isn't for me. And when you're feasting, it's not really for me. So the first attack was on empty religion. That was the first message in God's response to their questions about should they continue these fast for the, as a memorial to the destruction of the temple. The second one was a reminder of Israel's past failures to be righteous. What God is going to get at now is, folks, I know you think you're righteous because you exercise these rituals. You're kidding yourself. That doesn't make you righteous. Now, in some religions, false religions, people honestly think that they are more righteous. 
I, I saw a, a film the other day. It was about the Irish uprising back in the uh, 19, in 1916. And, uh, of course, it was, a, and I'm not here to bash Catholics, but there was uh, one of the scenes where a bunch of, of, of Irishmen had been killed, and they had a funeral for them. And, of course, it's Roman Catholic. And it, it went on, for, for it seemed like endlessly, people say, Holy Mary, Holy Mary, I don't know, you know, some of you Catholics know that deal, but they, had, they had this, this little phrase about Mary, Mother of God, and they kept repeating it over and over and over. In the film, I thought, this is the problem people have. They think they can take a ritual. They thought they were scoring points. They were getting their friend out of purgatory by praying to Mary, but they just had a phrase, and they repeated it over and over and over and over again. And they, it was like they, they thought it made them righteous. And people have a habit of thinking that way. What God wants to do is nip that in the bud. So uh, the Israelites uh, suffered from the delusion that practicing religious rituals made them righteous. True righteousness stood in stark contrast to empty ritualism, which he's going to talk about in just a moment. A failure to be righteous had led to their punishment. They'd gone into Babylonian captivity because they weren't genuinely righteous. They practiced religious rituals, but they don't make you righteous. Verses 8 through 12. And the word of the Lord came again to Zechariah. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Administer true justice. Show mercy and compassion to one another. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the alien or the poor. In your hearts do not think evil of each other. In short, you folks have been doing a lot of religious rituals, but you're not showing compassion to one another. You are oppressing the wither, widows and the fatherless and the alien and the poor. You are thinking evil of you. You pass a lot of r religious rituals. You don't miss Passover. You celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread. You celebrate all these wonderful uh, fe uh, annual feasts, but you're not righteous. But they refused to pay attention. Stubbornly, they turned their backs and stopped up their ears. They made their hearts as hard as flint and would not listen to the law, to the words that the Lord Almighty had sent by his spirit through the earlier prophets. So the Lord Almighty was very angry. In short, one of the reasons they went away into Babylonian captivity was not because of a failure to exercise religious rituals, but because they were not a righteous people. And he reminds them of that. So there were four messages God gave in response to their requests about the fast fasting. First was an attack on empty religi uh, ritualism. The second was a reminder of Israel's past failures to be righteous. The third was a promise of a future restoration of Israel. If you notice, as we've gone through all of these 16 prophets, they invariably fall back on a promise of the great millennial kingdom. So it shouldn't be surprising to any of us that when Jesus came to earth, the apostles were constantly saying, when are you going to set up the kingdom? When are you going to set up the kingdom? It gets a little tiresome. I mean, the night Jesus was betrayed and, and, and he celebrated the Passover, what were the, the apostles at that time, we think of his disciples, what were they talking about? When he was set up the kingdom. A little bit earlier when he was talking about how he was going to have to go to the cross and suffer and die for the sins of mankind. They said, that's all well and good, but when are you going to set up the kingdom? Well, it's easy to, for us to criticize him for that, but part of the history of Israel was a history of 16 prophets constantly reminding the children of Israel that one day, in spite of all their difficulties, uh, God was going to restore Israel and, uh, and make it the ruling nation on the earth, and this is all part of the millennial reign of Christ. This will take place at the time of the millennium. Zechariah chapter 8, verses 3 through 5. This is what the Lord says. I will return to Zion and dwell in Jerusalem. Then Jerusalem will be called the city of truth, and the mountain of the Lord Almighty will be called the holy mountain. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Once again, men and women of ripe old age will sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each with cane in hand because of his age. The city streets will be filled with boys and girls playing there. Won't that be glorious? Playing, that's okay, have fun. And continuing in verses 7 through 8, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I will save my people from the countries of the east and the west. I'll bring them back to live in Jerusalem. It's already starting to happen. They will be my people, and I will be faithful and righteous to them as their God. Okay, four messages in response to their request 
about whether or not they should fast for the destruction of Jerusalem. The first was an attack on the empty ritual, ritualism in Israel. The second was a reminder of Israel's past failures to be righteous. They had a lot of rituals, but they weren't righteous. The third was a promise of future restoration. One day, no matter what, I'm going to keep the promises I made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm going to keep the promises I made to Israel's fa founding fathers and restore you no matter what. God is a man of his word. Isn't that wonderful? The fourth was a promise uh, Israel's future would be a joy. Now, to stiff-necked Christians, this is tough. I understand that. <laughs> but it's okay to have fun. He not only said, one day I'm going to restore you, talking about the millennial reign of Christ, but it's going to be a joy. You're going to enjoy it. You can laugh. You can have fun. It's okay to have fun. It's okay to have fun. Some people think that if you have fun, somehow that's irreligious. That's not true. God is not anti-joy. He's not anti-happy. I like that. Thank you. Amen some more on that. I don't get it. One guy agrees with me anyway. <laughs> but it's true. I've been in some circles that seem, I mean, I, I, I've probably quoted this many times, too. I'm paraphrasing from Charles Spurgeon. But Charles Spurgeon looked around the preachers of his day and said, most of these guys are so sour-faced, they would be better off being undertakers than preachers. Because they were unhappy, they were sour, sort of like to smile and have fun. What God is saying, this great millennial kingdom is going to be a joy, folks. The Jews will be held, and not only that, the Jews will be held in reg high regard throughout the world. That's one of the reasons it's going to be very special for Jews. This hasn't been true for 2,000 years. But during the millennium, they're going to move, move from being one of the most despised nations on earth to the most celebrated nation on earth. Zechariah chapter 8, verses 18 through 23. Three. Again, the word of the Lord Almighty came to me. This is what the Lord Almighty says. The fast of the fourth, fifth, seventh, and tenth months will become joyful and glad occasions and happy festivals for Judah. Therefore, love, truth, and peace. What he's saying is those, those four fasting days that you established to to, as a memorial to the destruction of the temple are not going to be fasting days. They're going to be days of feasting and celebration during the millennium. During those four months, you're going to have a good time. Some of you won't, maybe, but most of us will. <laughs> this is what the Lord Almighty says. Many people and inhabitants of many cities will yet come. And the inhabitants of one city will go to another and say, let us go at once to entreat the Lord and seek the Lord Almighty. I myself am going, and many peoples and powerful nations will come to Jerusalem to seek the Lord Almighty and to entreat him. This has not happened, but it's going to happen during the millennium. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In those days, ten men from all languages and nations will take firm hold of one Jew by the hem of his robe and say, let us go with you, because we have heard that God is with you. They're going to move from being a despised people to a celebrated people. And people are, are living in La La, and if they think, La La Land if they think that anti-Semitism is dying out. It's getting worse. It has, in fact, been very much a part of Western civilization for the last 2,000 years. It's, it's gaining grounds again in Europe. It's always been part of Europe's culture. After the Holocaust, people seem to have been a little bit embarrassed. But now they've lost that, and they're going back to being as anti-Semitic as they used to be. So four messages God gave to the Israelites in response to the question about fasting. The first was an attack on empty ritualism. The second was a reminder of Israel's past failures to be righteous. A third was a promise of a future restoration of Israel. And a fourth was a promise that Israel's future, that future restoration, is going to be a joy. You're going to have fun during the millennium. It's going to be a wonderful, wonderful time. I'm looking forward to it. I wish it would start next week. Okay. Huh, I, what? Thank you for correcting me. <laughs> I'm a little slow. Okay, Zechariah can be divided into three sections. The first section was chapters 1 through 6. In that section, we were given eight visions about God's future plans for Israel. In section 2, chapters 7 through 8, 
uh, we will give, God gave us four messages in response to the questions about fasting. In section three, God gives us two oracles. And these oracles are divine pronouncements. And there are two oracles in these six chapters. Chapters 9, 10, and 11, oracle number one. Chapters 12, 13, and 14, oracle number two. The first oracle spoke about the Messiah's first coming and rejection. That's chapters 9 through 11. The second oracle spoke about Messiah's second coming to reign. The first coming, and he came the first time and was rejected. He will come the second time to reign. The first oracle not only speaks about his first coming and rejection, but it also, in typical Eastern book fashion, speaks a little bit about his second coming. And also, uh, Zechariah wrote about a prediction that Jerusalem would be protected from Alexander the Great, which happened about 350 years before Christ came. The second oracle, which speaks about Christ's second coming to reign, is an oracle in which he speaks not only about Christ's coming, but a number of end-time events. Let's look at the first oracle. first oracle was about Christ's first coming and rejection, and he spoke about uh, Jerusalem being protected from Alexander the Great. That's chapter 9, verses 1 through 8. Now, if you turn to chapter 9, verses 1 through 8, you'll say, there's nothing in here about Alexander the Great. That's true. The Bible is interesting in the way it's put together. Sometimes everything is up in your face blunt. Thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. No subtlety there. Very clear. Don't steal. You know the drill. But sometimes it's a little bit more subtle in the way it presents things. And that's the case in this situation. If you read the first eight verses, or let me rephrase that, the first seven verses of chapter 9, you'll find that that's a description of Alexander the Great's march from Syria to Phoenicia to Philistia to Egypt. And his claim on those nations as he marched from Syria to uh, Phoenicia to Philistia to Egypt. And along the way, he burned city after city after city after city. But when he came to Jerusalem, he didn't. And Zechariah predicted that he would not, even though it never mentioned his name. And the tradition is that the reason Alexander the Great didn't destroy Jerusalem the way he destroyed the cities prior to that occasion and further south was because Jedua, the high priest, came out and met Alexander the Great and read for him chapter 8 of Daniel, where Daniel predicted that, Alec that, that a Greek king would destroy the Persians. And, of course, that's what Alexander the Great was doing in the Middle East at the time. He came there to do battle with the Persians. He was so impressed with what the Jewish high priest had to say that he spared Jerusalem. Now, with that little bit in mind, let's look at Alexander the Great's march through the Middle East. Greece, as many of you know, was never much of a unified country. There were a lot, Egypt was a unified country. Uh, Babylon was a unified country. The Assyrians were unified around Nineveh. The Persians had a unified country. Greece was never really much of a unified country. It was really a bunch of city-states that acted independently of each other and often went to war against each other. But in the 4th century, a man named Philip of Macedonia managed to sort of tenuously... Uh, unify the Greek city-states, Philip of Macedonia. And then he died, and he passed over this sort of unified country to his son, Alexander the Great. And what Alexander the Great did, who is probably many considered one of the greatest generals who ever lived, got the Greek army together and set out to conquer their age-old enemy, the Persians. And so what he did was he, he got them together, and they marched, they crossed from Europe into Asia Minor, which is, this is modern-day Turkey, through the Straits of Dardanelles. Dardanelles are the straits that connect the Aegean Sea with the Black Sea. And they engaged the Persian army 
under the leadership of Darius III at Granicus River and defeated the Persian army, but not decisively. Much of it was left. And uh, Darius III escaped along with a big chunk of the army. He fled and engaged Alexander the Great a little later on in Isis. Meanwhile, Alexander was able to march through Asia Minor, wreaking havoc on everyone everywhere he went. And he engaged the Persians again at Isis. And again, he defeated them, but not decisively. Much of the army was able to escape under the leadership of Darius III. And they ran off back to Persia. Alexander the Great then had a chance. He could have gone east and followed the Persian army and uh, uh, Darius III, or he could move south. He decided to move south. And what he did was he marched through Syria and Phoenicia and Philistia down to Egypt and sort of claimed these countries for himself. And along the way, he burned city after city after city. But when he got right down here, uh, approaching Jerusalem, that's when Jedua went out, read to him the prophecy from Daniel chapter 8, a prophecy that predicted that he would defeat the Persians. Alexander the Great said, that's wonderful. Now, that's a tradition. We don't know that to be true. We know, however, that he did not destroy Jerusalem. We know that he destroyed lots of other cities as he marched through the Middle East, and he was victorious essentially everywhere he went. We don't know absolutely that he spared Jerusalem because Jedua went out and read that passage to him from Daniel. But that's a tradition I like to believe. But I don't know if that's absolutely true. But we know that he did spare Jerusalem. Anyway, he went down, conquered Egypt, and then uh, returned, uh, and then did go east and engaged the Persians at Arbella. And there he defeated the Persians decisively. And uh, Darius III fled and was killed by some of his own soldiers. And then Alexander the Great continued to march toward India and actually would have conquered India and gone on to China, but his soldiers said, enough already, we're tired. He returned, and uh, that was in 331 B.C. that he defeated them decisively at Persia. And this began the Greek era of the Greeks controlling uh, the Israelites. And uh, Alexander the Great died in 323 B.C. Uh, he was only 20, 32 years old. He conquered everything along the way. Someone once, I read somewhere that Alexander the Great is the envy of all generals because I mean, he was in early 20s when he, when he conquered the Persians. He was a remarkable general. In any event, what I, the, I went through all that because I wanted to help explain to you one of the prophecies that Zechariah wrote about. And the first oracle, uh, oracle about the Messiah's first coming and rejection he talked about being, uh, Israel being protected from Alexander the Great. As pointed out, chapters 9, verses 1 through 8, gives a brief description of Alexander's march and victories from Syria to Egypt. He destroyed cities all along the way. He spared Jerusalem. And Zechariah wrote this. After, in the first seven verses, he gives a description of Alexander's marches from Syria to Egypt. But in, chapter, in, in verse 8, Zechariah wrote, I will defend my house against the marauding forces. And the tradition was the Jesuit read Daniel chapter 8 to him. All right, continuing on. <clears throat> first point that Zechariah made in his first oracle was that Jerusalem would be protected from Alexander the Great. The second point is that when the Messiah came the first time, he would come riding on a donkey. Most of us know about this. Zechariah wrote, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. We know that that's exactly what Jesus did on the Sunday prior to his crucifixion when he made his triumphal entry in Jerusalem. He came riding on a donkey. So, point one in the first oracle was that Jerusalem would be protected from Alexander the Great. The second point, that the Messiah would come riding on a donkey. The third point was that the Messiah would be rejected and betrayed for 32 pe or 30 pieces of silver. Zechariah wrote, I told them, if you think it best, give me my pay. But if not, keep it. So they paid me 
30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, the handsome price at which they priced me. The Jews, well, you know the story. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord to the potter. Now, what is Zechariah getting at? We know that this was a prediction that one day uh, the Jewish leaders would consider Jesus was worth 30 pieces of silver. That's the price they valued me at, 30 pieces of silver. And that's the, the price they gave to Judas Iscariot to portray Jesus, which he did. But then something unusual happened. They actually arrested Jesus and planned on having him executed. This was a surprise to Judas Iscariot. The, the thinking probably, and Judas then, as you know, was stricken with remorse. He tried to return the money, uh, but they, the Jewish leaders would not take the money, so he threw it into the house of the Lord, into the temple. Uh, but because it was blood money, they couldn't keep it, so they said, what we'll do is we'll buy this potter's field and use that as a graveyard for foreigners who die in our country which fits right into what Zechariah wrote. Now, some of you wonder about why did Judas Iscariot, uh, why was he stricken with remorse and want to return the money? Well, the reason is almost certain, we're not t the, the, exactly, and then he went out and committed suicide. We're not told exactly why, but if you put the pieces together, it's something like this. Judas Iscariot, for three and a half years, had seen Jesus escape arrest time and time and time and time again. Over and over and over. Crowds wanted to, to throw him off a cliff in Nazareth. Uh, the officials wanted to arrest him. J Judas Iscariot was disappointed because Jesus hadn't set up the kingdom. He followed Jesus because he thought he was the Messiah and that he would set up the kingdom. And if he followed him along with the other disciples, that he would be a ruling official and the kingdom that the Messiah was setting up. That's the reason he was following him. But he wouldn't set up the kingdom. In fact, he seemed determined not to set up the kingdom. He kept talking about dying. That's not what Judas's reason Judas Iscariot was following Jesus. So apparently what he had decided to do was forget his relationship. Jesus wasn't setting up the kingdom. He was going to cash in and leave. So he thought, well, I'll make a little money on my way out. I will betray him, but he will escape that we always escapes. Because he always had. He, they tried to, to arrest him. They tried to kill him repeatedly during the three and a half years. Jesus always escaped. Judas Iscariot almost certainly assumed that Jesus would escape after being betrayed. But he wasn't. That's not what he was expecting. So then he was stricken with remorse. He tried to return the money. They wouldn't accept it, so he threw it into the house of the Lord. And then the Jewish officials took the money, bought the potter's field as a burial place, for uh, foreigners who died in Jerusalem. So I told them, Zechariah wrote, if you think it best, give me my pay, but if not, keep it. So they paid me 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, the handsome price at which they priced him. That's what they viewed he was worth, 30 pieces of silver. So I took the 30 pieces of silver, threw them into the house of the Lord to the potter. All right, first oracle. Jerusalem would be protected from Alexander the Great. The Messiah would come riding on a donkey. The Messiah would be rejected and betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Second oracle is an oracle to do not with the Messiah's first coming, but with his second coming, uh, coming to reign. Zechariah describes a number of end-time events. First, Jesus will, the Israel will accept Jesus at his second coming and mourn. First coming, he was rejected. Uh, the second coming, Zechariah predicted that they will accept him and mourn over having rejected him the first time. Zechariah wrote, And I will pour out in the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one they have pierced. They pierced him. And they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child. This is how the Israelites are going to look upon Jesus when he returns to earth to set up his millennial kingdom. They will look upon me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. On that day, the weeping in Jerusalem will be great. This is the, the Jews, as we've talked about on a number of occasions, are going to 
come to embrace Jesus as the Messiah during the second half of the tribulation. And when he comes, they, they, it's talking about that whole really three and a half, the last three and a half years of, of tribulation when God's going to gather the Jews to the deserts of modern day Jordan and sift through them. And the Jews there, one third of the nation is going to turn and accept Jesus as their Messiah and grieve as a nation for having rejected him the first time. And that's what Zechariah is getting at in the 12th chapter. After mourning, there will be cleansing. On that day, a fountain will be opened to the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and impurity. On that day, I will banish the names of idols, the idols from the land, and they will be remembered no more, declares the Lord Almighty. I will remove both the prophets and the spirit of impurity from the land. He's talking about false prophets here. And if anyone still prophesies his father and mother, to whom he was born will say to him, you must die because you have told lies in the Lord's name. When he prophesies, his own parents will stab him. The point here is, I'm going to get rid of all idolatry, all false religions, and all false prophets. And the false prophets are those who deny that Jesus was the Messiah. He's talking about how Israel is going to respond to the Messiah when he comes the second time. After the morning, there will be cleansing. Not only will they embrace the Lord Jesus Christ as their Messiah and Savior when he comes the second time, they will grieve and mourn over having rejected him as a nation the first time, and they will be cleansed. No more wretchedness. One-third of the nation will repent, and two-thirds will die. Zechariah chapter 13. In the whole land, declares the Lord, two-thirds will be struck down and perish, yet one-third will be left in it. This third I will bring into the fire. I will refine them like silver and test them like gold. They will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people, and they will say, the Lord is our God. This is going to be a glorious day. At last, after thousands and thousands of years, Israel as a nation, one third of the nation, is going to look upon their God and embrace him. And finally, the second oracle ends with a description of the Battle of Armageddon. The Battle of Armageddon is actually uh, um, discussed in a number of places throughout the, both the Old and the New Testament. And uh, Zechariah is just one of many places that talk about this great end-time battle. Zechariah wrote, A day of the Lord is coming when your plunder will be divided among you. I will gather the nations of Jerusalem to fight against it. The city will be captured, the houses ransacked, the women raped. Half the city will go into exile, but the rest of the people will not be taken from the city. The Lord, then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. This is where he's going to return. When he returns, he'll return. He will land on top of the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west forming a great valley with half of the mountain moving north and half moving south. So Mount of Olives is going to be split in two with a valley in between. <clears throat> you will flee by my mountain valley where it will extend to Azel. Azel, we think, is a city just east of the Mount of Olives. We can't be certain about that. You will flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. That's us. We're coming with him. On that day, there will be no light, no cold or frost. It will be a unique day without daytime or nighttime, a day known to the Lord. When evening comes, there will be light. So this is hard to kind of figure out what this day is going to, it's going to be. This is the day the Lord returns. Uh, without daytime, nighttime, no light, no cold, no frost. Very interesting. On that day, living water will flow, out, will flow out from Jerusalem, half to the eastern sea and half to the western sea, in summer and in winter. The Lord will be king over the whole earth. On that day, there will be one Lord and his name, the only name. Glorious day. Zechariah is divided into three sections. Section 1, chapters 1 through 6, eight visions about God's future plans for Israel. Section 2, four messages in response to questions about fasting. And section 3, two oracles about our Lord's coming. One oracle is about his first coming, and they threw in some information about Alexander the Great. And the second oracle 
is about our Lord's second coming, when the Israelites will look upon him whom they pierced, and they will mourn. And I think our time is up. Uh, you've got notes on Malachi. Lord willing, next week we will look at Malachi. He's the last of the Old Testament books. And uh, we should finish that up next week. And then we're at, we've spent five months, or uh, five months, I wish five months, <coughs> five years. And actually we started it uh, five years ago this month. We started this Bible survey. And uh, we will have gone through all, we will have gone through 38 of the 39 Old Testament books in the past five years. Uh, the one book I sort of shortchanged you on was, uh, what was it? Lamentations, thank you. But I didn't mention it in Jeremiah, because he wrote it. <laughs> but after going through all, the, all of Jeremiah that I'd gone through, I was weeping along with him. <laughs> so I said, enough weeping. But anyway, we will spend five years going through 38 of the 39 Old Testament books. And Lord willing, after um, we do Malachi next week, we will then move on to the life of Christ. And, uh, but we're, gonna, we're not going to take one, New Test one gospel and then the second and the third. We're going to put them together in a harmony and take it sequentially from the beginning to the end using... We did this uh, 18 years ago. Some of you probably were here. I know some of you old folks were here. Uh, from 2000, what was it, 2001 that we've been in, to 2018. Yeah. So, yeah, it was that long ago. It was 2001 to 2008. So we did seven years. Um, we're not going to take seven years this time because I don't have that many years left in me. But uh, we'll probably, it'll probably take us four or five. I'm rewriting the notes. So those who are here for that seven-year ordeal, uh, you're going to get a fresh set of notes. I'm going to rewrite them. But the life, I, I thought after five years in the Old Testament, I needed to, I needed to see Jesus. <laughs> and the game plan is this. On Sunday evening lectures, we're going to be going through the time of preparation and his public ministry. As you know, the life of Christ can be divided into three periods of time. Period of preparation, uh, preparation that's his birth, his, his, the announcement of his birth, and his birth, and his childhood, then his period of public ministry, uh, which was about three and a half years, and then this period of sacrifice, which was the last two months. So what I'm going to be doing on the Sunday evening lectures will be going through the time of preparation and his public ministry. And then on Sunday morning, I'm going to be preaching through the period of sacrifice. That will only take about a year. The first two periods... We're going to cut it down from seven to something more reasonable. I don't think I'll live long enough to do that many. But that's the game plan. In any event, what? Uh, I don't know. I can, I'll, I'll, I'll squeeze the notes down to something smaller. But it's, uh, it's a great study, the life of Christ. I miss it. So we'll hopefully enjoy it. But anyway, next week we'll do Malachi, Lord willing, and then we'll wrap it up and start the life of Christ. Father, we love you. We worship you again. We thank you for your many blessings to us. What a glorious God you are. It is so good to know that you run things. We live in a world that's gone mad. But I read through the scriptures, and that world was mad as well. You, however, have come to our rescue. You've saved us from ourselves and saved us from a priceless eternity, and for that we are forever grateful. I pray you'll give everyone in this room a good week. Bring us back safely next week to sing your praises. In Jesus' name we pray.